Hi, I'm Joyce Krieger and this is ArtLink, Conversations with Artists and Art Professionals. My guest today is Kate Landishaw, an artist from Greenville, South Carolina. Welcome, Kate. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Nice to have you. Kate and I have been chatting on and off for the past few months. Yeah. And one of the things I'd like her to share with our audience today is Kate grew up in Chicago and basically moved to Boston. And now she's in the deep south. So Kate, what is it like when you come from a culture vulture area like Boston or Chicago and move to the deep south? Well, it's a pleasant weather change <laughs> in the winter, <laughs> in the winter only. Um, it's, you have to find your own culture, you have to find your own level, you have to, it's a little harder to find. You don't have great art things hitting you in the face, but it's not impossible to find. There are great people down there and really good artists too. Did you find that being in Boston had more inspiration for you than you have down there? Or is it simply I move and I take my art and my brain with me and I work? Hmm, I, I never thought of it. Um, Boston was a very different energy level, a very different realm of energies, of course, and I miss it terribly, but I find other energies down there different. It's, um, it, it's just different. I don't know how much how to say. It's interesting because one of the things, if I may quote you, oh, is the power of art for me is in its energy, its motion, the visual tension created by form and color and line. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that relates to your work. And we're looking back here at one of Kate's pieces. And can you tell us a little bit about what that energy is all about? Where does it come from? Um, I don't, how do you translate it into your work? I don't know where it comes from specifically. I know that. I paint a background that I like or think might be interesting and then that guides me or suggests to me where it wants me to put a line or a decor piece, an energy, because then they kind of grow on each other, they build on each other. The energy, the painting feeds the energy and then the energy goes back into the artwork. It's a, a feeding, rolling kind of thing. It's interesting because most artists that I work with actually start with an idea. <laughs> And they do a drawing, or they do lay down a, a you know a, a little color to give them an idea and mm -hmm. a direction. Your work is very different. It seems to grow from within. So tell us a little bit about that process. About the process. Well, I do lay out a ground, um, and that is that grows from my original painting style, which was largely abstract expressionist color form but again energy and then it didn't have a lot of detailed energy in it and then I let the background suggest and of course I'm also um, inclined to just piles and piles of pens and pencils and inks <laughs> and paints and brushes and objects that I enjoy using so uh, that day I might want to play with blues, I might want to play with silvers, I might want to play with greens. They'll kind of call me and I have no idea why. Uh, well, I do have an idea, of course, if I've done a background, if I've done a ground, it's going to tell me what colors it wants. But they are, the ground and the drawing painting on it is, are very separate, very different. Process, One of the things the I think that makes your work a little different is that you're a painter, mm -hmm. but you actually draw on your paintings. And one of the things that might be interesting for the audience to know is that Kate works pretty small. And one of the things that we recently did is together we worked and we blew up one of the pieces that Kate had and we did it, printed it digitally on canvas and then you went back and worked into I did. it. I did. How was that experience? That was quite interesting because I got closer to the work. I learned more about my own line. I um, Matching the colors again or not matching the colors was, a, was both a challenge and fun. And working on the tr uh, treated canvas, of course, with was a completely different, different surface. Straight, yeah. Totally different surface. And also, I tried to enhance some of the spaces and densities 
and I've added sections to the work and enhanced others to again to try to, to see if see if it'll create more depth. So is this make something different. you might do again? Oh sure. Absolutely. It was fun. I like it. Another quote that I love that you gave me, if I may share it with our audience, is I splash about in an idea pool without knowing which lane is mine, so to speak, and drift. Yes. Tell me more about that because I know you're also a poet. And the poetry that you write, tell us a little bit about how that might inform some of your artwork. It's all, I guess, non-objective, I guess, is the proper term for it because it doesn't really have a foundation in what, in a scene, in a specific scene or in a specific story. It comes, again, as sort we spoke about, from conscience. itself, a stream of consciousness. The poetry, my poetry is also free-flowing, free-form, I guess they call it, I'm not sure. Um, I do like to structure into haiku occasionally when I can, when I can, can get myself... Can you explain like what that is? I, I knew oh. when I was in school, but <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a certain a brief, amount of words. It's a certain amount of words, and it's a certain number of syllables, really, not okay. words. And you have a, it's usually three lines, and I've seven, five, seven for okay. syllables, something like that. And there's a total number of syllables, and also haiku has many different definitions. You can look it up and find many different forms that are many different people will tell you is the form. So it's, it's, a, it's also semi-free form. But in a haiku, you will have little descriptions. Um, one of the ones I wrote is um, Christmas tree lights on an evergreen tree. Nothing can touch my heart. They are two separate concepts that sort of relate, that, or that they relate in the mind of the writer and hopefully of the reader. So at one point you talked to me a little bit about maybe writing more poetry and having each piece of art sort of inspired and informed by that poetry. Is that something you're still thinking about? I'm still thinking about doing that. That has to do with the dreamscape kind of quality of it and the haikus that would just create a little mood or create a little mental scene. We actually may talk, or may not. Did we not actually talk about a performance where maybe the entire gallery, oh. you would draw throughout the whole gallery and then maybe do your poetry. That would be fun. That would be delightful. Yes, that would be a great idea. And then I also like the idea of having other people come in and be free to add to the work themselves, cut out pieces if they wanted to. That's en a great en idea. Engaging, having, having, the, having the art engage the viewers. That's one of my strong desires. I want the work to engage Talk to me a little bit about that, because that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, because it was important in our talk together that what you do is not only for you, Kate Landishaw, yeah. but you want to put it out in the world, and you want people to respond. I do. That's exactly How does right. that make you feel when you see people react to your work? It makes me feel very good, and it also is somewhat enlightening, because if they tell me that they see something in it, Everybody sees something different. I don't see anything. Most of the time, I don't see anything specific in the work. Um, and then someone sees, oh, I don't know, the last one I was working on. Someone saw a tree of life giving off wonderful uh, a home for insects over there. And then somebody else saw a um, dragon, dragon down there. And so people, and people come to the work with their own field of history, with their own history, with their own knowledge of what they think things are. And I'm sure different colors mean different things to different people. Do you think that art is meant to, particularly abstract art, for people to find things in it? Or <sighs> is it really about bringing out an emotion or a feeling or something that will reflect in their past? In other words, being able to stand in front of a work of art that's abstract and like you do with music, it moves you. Well, that's the point. And how it moves a person, whether it takes them down their own memory lane, whether it inspires new thoughts, whether it looks like a bluebird in a cantaloupe, who knows <laughs> what, it, what it might be, but it doesn't matter to me if they're engaged with it. I don't have any so preconceived just, ideas. So you want of, that relationship. Yes, I think, I think art should, I think art should, the, the Art as a role in the universe wants to engage people 
with their own heads. You just upshot me, because my last question always is, <laughs> what is art? And you just answered it well, well in so advance sorry. of what I had wanted to ask. Okay. Um, another thing that you said to me when I asked you, when you look at your work, what do you see? And your response to me was, something unusual, as if it never came from me. That's pretty profound. I hadn't thought of it one way or the other. It's, it's more as if I'm a tool or an instrument that the work is coming through. I obviously have to have some connection to the creation consciously, but since I don't, I know what I'm doing technically, but I don't know in advance what I'm creating. I have tried and thought, oh gee, I'll have this plan. And I have done some work that, yes, okay, then I have this plan and I do it. And sometimes that's worthwhile and comes out well and sometimes it doesn't. But I don't, I don't usually plan a work. It, 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 the, the energy, it's again, the energies feed on themselves with the material I'm using. So it's sort of like a meditation for you, a journey. Would Perhaps. that make sense? Because I know I we sure talk lose track of time. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly lose track of time. I think artists have a tendency to do that. That's part of what keeps them engaged in it. Well, that's the thing. It's very engaging. And when I'm working on the work, I'm not particularly conscious of myself. Now, you brought Mark Toby's book with you. I because did. you and I talked a little <clears> bit. <throat> I said to you, I thought that there was some relationship between your work and his work. And you, who are Miss Curiosity, <laughs> immediately went out and bought the book. What did you find out from this book that would be helpful for people who might know Mark Toby's work or be interested in looking at it? Um, what, did you, what did you feel when you read about him? Did it relate to you at all? It related to me in the um, matter of his connection to his work being spiritual. Now, he followed a particular religion and he took the concept of that religion, Baha'i religion, he took the concept of that religion and translated it into his work. But he also dealt with the energies of it, and he, there is a place I marked where he talks about his line, and I certainly can't memorize it. While working on a painting in a small centrally lighted room, he imagined a fly moving about the room, crossing and recrossing its own path its route forming a complex of line, with form being entirely the product of movement. This concept underlies much of his mature painting. So the structure of the thing comes from the line, but the line is not outlining a cat or a suitcase or a 747 airplane. It's creating its own being by the line, and that is what I do. Um, if you do see form in there, it's not because I drew the shape and then filled it in and sh shaded it to make the hips on a cat or something like that. It's because the you see a form in there that came from... Well, you told me like that when you go out for a walk and you see the cracks in the sidewalk or you see the shadows in the sky, all of this is inspiration to you. It's, inspir it's, it's conscious. Yeah, it, it becomes part of me and it's... It's all, it's all very intriguing. And I'm also addicted to taking pictures of these things. I love to frame the set of cracks. Because to me, the cracks are, if, if they are, the, the mica in the sidewalk at night is very pretty. If you have a, under the it street twinkles. lights. It does, it's oh, so shiny. It's, it, it, it's fun. And also the way the shadows of the buildings against the sky, depending at dusk, some beautiful, beautiful things happen. And trees, the, the the lines of trees, the skylines with trees, and at certain times of the day, you can just see this kind of chunk of trees, but if you look at it carefully or you look at it for any length of time, you see many different densities of color. Now, and your early work, earlier work before mm -hmm. you started doing these, mm -hmm. actually were a series of trees. I did work with, did and drawings. And we will of add those in to show our viewers after our conversation. Okay. But um, they were layered. I remember seeing, what was the material that you used to layer them? I used Duralar to make the urban jungles a section of my, my work. Um, and there are trees that go with a cityscape that go with some, with some color, brightly colored background. Those are very brightly colored. 
they grew from the tree series that I was doing, which was to try to capture the, on a two-dimensional plane, capture the three-dimensional sense of being under trees. And prior to that, I had done cityscapes. So then I just melded those all together with bright colors to, I had done black and white and oh, sienna and grays and tans and other browns, cityscape, linear, very linear cityscapes. And the markings I, that you used on those paintings, the markings and your marks are really what characterize your work. I've been told that. I and have been told that. Where does that come from? I have no idea. I mean, the markings <laughs> on these pieces are entirely different than the markings on the tree series, but they relate in one way. They sort of, this may have grown out of that. <clears throat> but it's always interesting to me you know, I'm a play, I play at art, I'm not an artist, and I always marvel. And I think a lot of the people in our audience, you know, may have dabbled with art but are not serious artists. Where does it all come from? I think it's just one of these miracles, sort of like the plane taking off and going in the sky. It's like magic. It just you mean comes creating from art? this creative brain. I mean, Everything you see and everything you do. I mean, the vest that you're wearing, you made. Well, Tell us a little it. bit about that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's so cool. That was from a period in the oh, late 80s. Heaven help us. Late 80s, um, I had a teeny weeny little condo, and there was no room to make art, and I had an ordinary office -y job. But I, I'm always making art anyway. And so what I started doing was put, tacking fabric, ordinary fabric to the wall, and painting it. And then I would <laughs> turn it into things. Um, one year, everybody got painted pillows. I just <laughs> cut up the fabric and m made pillows. We have a sewing machine, and stuffed them, and then they get pillows for Christmas. And then I decided I'd make vests, because why don't I wear my own art? I think that's pretty cool. And, um, it, and part of the reason I ended up getting a studio is because the house was strung when I had moved to South Carolina. The house was strung with, with wires and strings across. The living room was not a sane place to be because it had fabric drying, oil paint fabric drying. And then I made vests and vests and vests and vests and vests. And I did sell them a few times. And then I got tired of sewing because it's fun to paint the fabric and then you cut it out in a style, in, 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 you cut it in places or I cut it in places that I thought would make a reasonable I think it's pretty cool. This is the first time something. I saw it. You talked to me about it, but all of a sudden it shows up and it's pretty cool. Well, and, and I did make the vest, but I got tired of sewing because I really wanted to paint. A lot of artists now are kind of determined to earn a living, hmm. as you are, hmm. and as many of the artists that I coach and work with. And a lot of them are thinking about outside-of-the-box ideas, mm -hmm. and some of them are doing... Um, painting on luggage I've seen. I've seen artists doing um, <laughs> paintings for Pottery Barn, all of those things. Do you think that demeans the work? No, I don't. I do have friends who say, well, that your work is going to show up in Pottery Barn and be on every teacup. And if, if people like the work, all right, let me digress for a moment. I am known to be an art snob and much an elitist with the art, but that is for my personal being and my personal self. My feeling is that anything that anybody decides is art and they enjoy as art is by definition art. And I, I live in an area where people don't really have that much art. It's not something they think about or they consider art to be largely representationally important. It has to look like, it has to be a great portrait of their grandchild. And they have lots of photographs around. And a lot of people live in small places up in the hills in North Carolina, for instance. I have a relative that um, has no art on the wall except for a calendar. And my feeling is that's good. She it liked the calendar picture. And that tells her something. And it gives her pleasure. And that is what art is supposed to do. As far as I'm concerned, what you think is pleasurable. And at some point, she may say, you know, hmm. Maybe I want another picture. Well, I think it's become more common. I mean, you take people as well known as Damien Hirst or even Andy Warhol. They were they did commercial things and made money doing. Well, Peter, Ma that's how Peter, Peter Max, Max started, right? With his with the ashtrays, the the love 
sign. Yeah, and um, and then, well, we know who he is, but the uh, but yes, of course, that's and that it gives people a way to have, and a lot of people aren't willing to or able to spend a fair amount of money for wall art. A lot of people want very quiet homes. They have show homes, and a lot of people don't express themselves with other people's art. But if you have a throw pillow that might be a Jackson Pollock on one side, and it might be plain denim on the other, and so you can not insult some in-laws, but you can also have a wonderful party piece. You know, it's, I think I mean, it's, I it's, always, I always feel like I'm treading on very thin ice when I work with an artist and I say to an artist, you know, your work is beautiful. It would do great you know, like on a cover of a magazine or a, a book or a sure. record album. Sure. And, you know, at first they would kind of glance at me. And, but now licensing. Licensing is a great has idea. Has become yep. a huge opportunity for artists that wouldn't have otherwise even thought about it. You know, their goal was to show in a museum or get a one person show. Well, you can show. show in a museum too. But the gallery scene now has changed so it dramatically. It has drastically. That with the internet, Galleries are suffering. If they Terrible. don't go to the major shows, they don't really succeed. And artists seem to be using the internet and social media more and more mm -hmm. to get the word out about their work. Right. And even though people are reluctant initially to do it, once they start and they get a little success, it feeds on one another. Well, the other thing too is, as I asked you how you felt about my having three separate styles of artwork on my website, whether that's a valid way for a proper artist to be, and I, you, you said yes, and Absolutely. I agree, because you, we do different styles and they serve different purposes. And um, you can have one set of uh, work license that's appropriate. You look for people because you want, I, you, I want anybody who wants to see my art and have it around to be able to. It's a thrill. I think it's great because it, it doesn't, when I make art, I've made it, it's nice. My studio mates see it, they love it, this is good. Um, but it's really wonderful when someone who doesn't know you sees it and responds to it because then I've touched the person in a positive way. Well, I told you what happened recently when I had discussed blowing up your work. Mm -hmm. I convinced you to do it, you did it, I went picked it up and it was in my car mm -hmm. and I was going to a client and not the easiest client I might address <laughs> I hope they're not listening to this program but I brought it up with me and lo and behold I showed it to them and the next thing I knew they asked me if they could hang it on the wall and, and you said it, yes it was absolutely instantaneous they related to it that they is, loved it that is it's this. hanging on the wall and it was like easy that's the reward and I, I want to get you to see it but I don't know if yes. we'll have a chance but I did send you the installation yes, shot it, to they're see great it. it's great it's nice to see things like that no it's very rewarding so let's call, take another quote because I always like to quote a, my artists here okay my work possesses and reshapes all I see and hear through color and line, ending up with imagery that's been called meditative and ethereal. Yes. How does, <laughs> what made you say that when you go out and it reshapes all you see? So you're looking at work here and now you're going out into the world. How does that change how you look at the world? Good question. Um, I better get this one right because the next one's really a challenge. Okay, <laughs> fine. Um, no, I'm kidding you. If, because you're informed by everything. I am informed by everything I do or see. And I don't think I consciously remember. Well, I'd just be totally cluttered if I consciously remembered or thought about everything I did or saw. But I'm sure that I see things and they make me think of other things and they make me want and then of course we're again we're back to that camera thing because i do we stopped on newberry street and had to take a picture of a bunch of sewing machines old sewing machines like my mother's sewing machine these singer portables a whole big wall window wall full of them and somehow that's gonna play into something i do i don't know how but i know it will 
because of the shape and form of it. And I live, I live now with paintings that I've lived with by other people since I was a little girl. Well, I think basically artists carry sketchbooks all the time. Well, and there is that too. Tearing things yeah. out and sketching things that they see mm -hmm. or putting photographs in, knowing that it will either inform something that they do or well, it, something yes. they're working on will be enhanced mm -hmm. by that. And anything that I see, I'm also sometimes consciously and sometimes not saying, oh yeah, that's what, that, that's what I was doing. Because in seeing, oh, uh, oil slick things in water, um, patterns of leaves. There was a great, I was in a parking lot yesterday and there were these great, oh, at Jeannie's house, patterns of leaves on the ground. There were no leaves, there was just dirt and the framework, little pattern of the leaves. I think any artist cool. can relate to that yeah, because just, that's the creative mind. And that's you what, just see it, you notice it. I, I guess that's, you, I guess that's is it. Is that a curse? Is being creative a <laughs> curse or a pleasure because Sometimes you can't put that mind to rest, and it's challenging. It's, yeah, that's your challenging. Yes, it is a curse and a blessing. So this was another quote of yours. I love to do this. Apparently. I think I just figured something out. Ooh. Maybe I should characterize my work as unusual, but not so wild. It needs to be housebroken. <laughs> now, I know that you have a great sense of humor, and I know you love cats. Where did that come from? Well, it comes from the idea that many people are afraid of art or are intimidated by it. And they feel like, because we're, we're rational people, we're taught we're supposed to know what things are. We're supposed to know how things work and what they are. And sometimes you just don't. But that can be intimidating to certain people. And that, I think, is why much representational art is preferred. And Impressionism is especially lovely because it does represent what it is, a scene, usually a scene, but it is not so hard-lined. It's, it's translated that it's, really that it's, that it's stiff. Light. Yes, that, that it's stiff. Um, but a lot of abstract art, I remember somebody looking at one of the urban jungle, an older gentleman looking at one of the urban jungle things and saying, what's this supposed to be? <laughs> I said, well, you know, um, it's supposed to be Maybe, maybe make you think of something. I really don't know. And he said, you know, that's what it is. This looks like a spot on the lane down my grandmother's house. Oh, wow. And I'm thinking, oh, isn't that wonderful? I've certainly never been down the lane to his grandmother's house, but, he, but something made him think of that, so he took that memory. Well, this has been extremely <laughs> illuminating for me to hear how you achieve what you do, which I think has been really inspirational. And maybe some of the people out there uh, will have an opportunity when we release this video to um, email you some questions, because I'll always have your website on there. That's fine. That would and be good. I can't thank you enough for coming all the way from Greenville, South Carolina. <laughs> it's a good job. And visiting us here in the Boston area, and I love being maybe here. one day you'll come back. I will. I'll be back. Thank you so much for this. this Thank you, wonderful. Joyce. It's great.